All right. Okay, guys, thank you so much for joining. Give me one second to make sure everything's just pulling in. I have Blair Armitage with me right now. So you should be seeing her screen. And uh, I'm just going to check through and answer a couple of these questions. Uh, Adam, we are not broadcasting this to Facebook. It is going through Artist Awake. So it's just you guys. And, uh, okay, yeah, oh, yeah, you've already been answering the questions, so that's good. <laughs> that's what we wanted to get in. <laughs> All right. Okay, so just another second. Uh, those of you who are on Artist Awake, make a note in chat as soon as you hear me ask for that. That'd be great. And then we can go from there. And then uh, those of you who are here live with me, I see you guys. And uh, let's just make sure that we are doing this right. Okay, and there we go. All right, perfect. Yay. Okay, so Blair, thank you so much. No problem. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So now we're live. Um, so let me uh, let me just start. I'm gonna the normal way I like to do this is just like to ask a couple of questions, get to know things, um, and then I know a lot of the students that were asking to meet you uh, had questions which you've already been answering about the lighting and and kind of how you get that kind that illustrative quality. This just you know gorgeous quality uh, that really does the best out of 3D but keeps it illustrative. Um, mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about uh, your background and kind of how you got into this. Um, but first, I guess to set the stage, like what do you do now? Let's start there actually. What do you do now? Yeah, sure. So right now, um, for the last two months, I've yeah. been working as a character artist at Riot Games. Yeah. Um, that's been really great fun. Uh, before that, I was a freelance artist. Um, I was living in Japan for a year, uh, not working for any studios out there, but freelancing for um, a lot of US studios, actually. Mm -hmm. um, I managed to do some game work, which was really fun, and some stuff for miniatures, yeah. um, and also like larger size figurines. Mm -hmm. um, it's also like one of my big hobbies, so that was really great. Um, yeah. Got to do quite a variety of stuff. Uh, before that, I worked in um, I worked on uh, the Forza series, you know, the racing games. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. I worked on that in the UK. Um, that was a really nice little studio. Um, and then, yeah, before that, my start was probably back in I think it was around 2012, and that was working on Microsoft Connect games. If you remember those. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> nice. <laughs> That's yeah. great. All right. So what did you, how did you train to get into this industry? What did you do? Did you go to school, take classes, self-taught? Yeah, I, um, I went to university in the UK called um, De Montfort University in Leicester. Yeah. Um, they had a, a game art course. It, yeah. I think at the time it had been running for around five or six years. So it was still relatively new. Um, yeah. And things were quite different back then really it was compared to now it was a totally different time um so we learned you know traditional box modeling um like hand painted textures um things like um baking and using normal maps and using shaders were like only kind of starting to gain traction i mm. suppose in in like the ps3 era so uh, we were still very much kind of previous gen all the stuff we learned was more like PS2 stuff, but yeah. it was like a really, really good start, and and just like it was a really great course, and I think it, um, now it's uh, I'd actually really, really recommend that that university to anyone in the UK. It's it was really, really great, and I'm still in touch with all those guys. So that's great. That's what really great. would you say was really the a couple of let's say one thing that was really great about what they did in terms of how they um, how they trained you. Um, I think having just like simple lessons where you just had to make kind of simple objects like um, pick a building mm -hmm. or pick one prop mm -hmm. um, and then what I would do is I would repeat that lesson over and over again mm -hmm. until, I, until I understood what I was doing because it took me 
a very long time to understand 3D. Right. So it took me at least a year and then that entire summer of doing those simple lessons over and over again to just to understand what I was doing. It was it was very difficult for me to grasp it. Mm -hmm. Um because that was the first time I'd ever done 3D and um I was always like a someone who liked drawing and 2D. I never even when I was a kid I never played with Lego or I never really was interested in constructing things. Yeah. Yeah. Um and then when when we started to have some of the older students show ZBrush or like ZBrush as you guys call it. Yeah. Um <laughs> I like uh, Z. That, Zed's, I was, Zed's great. Yeah, guy. ZBrush. Yeah. Yeah, that was um <laughs> That was like that really made me interested in 3D because it was like oh I can do a painting yeah. almost but using using light and shadow to paint almost that made so much more sense to me than um like the box modeling approach but just kind of brute forcing those initial lessons of box modeling yeah. um I know it's probably not the most elegant way to learn but that's how I personally learn the best is sometimes just by brute force repeating stuff over mm. and over <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. That's great. So the key thing was uh, one lesson, something simple that you could just repeat yeah. until you yeah. felt like you had some level of mastery. Yes, that's that's very well described. Yeah, that's great. Actually, there's a um, there's a great section in the book uh, Talent Code, and it describes exactly that um, kind of learning where a young girl is playing violin and she'll play the part until she makes a mistake she'll stop she'll start over again until she makes a mistake stop start over until she can play it all the way through you know so that she can just make sure she's got this mastery so that's fantastic to kind of to hear you know it's it's uh, how we learn is 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 one of the things i really want to start to dive into here because you've also kind of in my mind you've got a style that you've worked with that i think is really um, it's very Blair, right? It's very much yours. Oh, thank you. you know? uh, do you feel like you have your own style? Do you feel like you have this way that you make these things? I don't know. Like, I think really to develop style, I think I started a lot by honestly copying other people, which uh, copying other artists that I liked. Mm -hmm. um, so I copy a lot of um, like the Russian and Chinese and Japanese artists because mm -hmm. I, I'm really into the kind of Eastern style. Yeah. Um, I just really like find my favorite artists. So like I would copy um, like Vadim's work and I would copy Bogdan's work and just kind of, and it's funny because those guys uh, like work at, you know, Riot and Blizzard and I kind of see them and it's mm -hmm. really strange because um, they're just like these normal people and I just, I just copy their stuff for the longest time to try and understand what they were doing. <laughs> yeah. And now um, you're working right there with them. Yeah, that's, that's really, really strange. Um, but yeah, I think the first step to doing it is imitation, Yeah, I'd say. And then eventually I just find you reach this level of confidence where you don't really copy in the same way. Like you kind of start to use reference in a different way where you're not really copying the shape of the facial features anymore, but you're more taking cues from what they've done with the forms to give everything a good shape mm -hmm. or how they've posed the character in more dynamic ways. Um, you kind of start taking cues of like more um, higher, higher level decisions rather than copying exactly how they've done a face, right. for example, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, that makes total sense to me. But for those of you who are um, watching this live, this is actually a really important, uh, I think, point for us to kind of drill just a little bit more on. So if you've got questions about this, make sure that you start. I'm looking at the chat right now, so I'll see the questions as they kind of come up. Um, yeah. But uh, this idea of, um, of, having, of, of imitating is something that um, I've seen my, my own students kind of work on because they're looking at your work. And they're like, how do I get there? And I want to do this work, you know, but then I don't want to just copy Blair. There's this like, there's this emotional kind of guilt. I guess yeah, you could say. I definitely understand that. It's, it does feel quite shameful. Yeah. But I think it's honestly like the first step really is just, is imitation. I think that's why you see a lot of stuff that does look very similar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any advice you can give for somebody who has that, that <laughs> guilt? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd say try and make 
your higher level creative decisions your own. Mm -hmm. So if you're trying to imitate someone's style, you could imitate the way they've done facial proportions or how they've executed on like a certain um, sculptural style in the skin or in the pose, but um, try to kind of make your own creative decisions as in what subject matter you're going to tackle. Like don't obviously like do the exact same characters or like something that's just very obviously derivative of mm. what they've done. Yeah. Um, so, so like um, I also kind of advise against them um, trying to to just out and out. I don't know what's your um, opinion on this, um, sure. but I, I don't really advise people to kind of copy existing pieces or existing characters and make a complete replica of it, mm -hmm. you, you know, almost as a study. I, I feel like, um, I suppose it's, it could be a useful exercise in just terms of craft, right. but um, I don't really like seeing those kind of things in portfolios. I guess I prefer to see things where they've tried to put a twist on it right. or they've taken something and done a character in a different style instead of just like a complete replica of a game character. Totally, yeah. Almost, because I feel like it never looks as good as it's the original, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then you're, I tell students this all the time, like especially in um, if they're doing uh, faces, I say, uh, you know, don't do likenesses. Do like the cousin of this person. Oh, yeah, right? yeah. Because you don't... Yeah, likeness is very difficult unless you want to be a likeness artist. Yeah, you're either on or you're off. And if you're off, you're off because you suck. <laughs> so <laughs> it's like the range for sucking is way too, way too risky for me. So I, but at the same time, this is something that's been around for, uh, for hundreds of years because artists have always had this approach of do we copy or not copy? And you go back to like yeah, Delacroix's right. like the time. Yeah, masters masters copied each other, right? Yeah. Yeah, but then not, right? Especially if you look at the Renaissance, you can see that they're copying, but they didn't. And then neoclassical mm. artists came and they really wanted to copy. But then you got guys like Delacroix who were, you know, the precursors to the Impressionists, stuff like that. Mm. You know, he was just interpreting. Yeah. So. I think the idea of having um, a mentor or being like a mentor is a good space to, to where you can kind of, copy things in a guilt-free way because mm -hmm. you're literally just trying to learn craft right um so i think being a student is a, 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 a good time to do that and i don't think you should really feel guilty about it and but yeah i'd say just differentiate in in what concepts you choose or um the finer points of style yeah that's great and hopefully we're going to get to steal and lift a couple of things from you today <laughs> <laughs> oh, for sure, yeah. <laughs> All right. And if, if anyone wants, like, to ask, like, more specific things or, like, specific examples, then I can also go into that. I'm trying to kind of talk in a more higher-level way for now. Yeah. Well, Adam is asking, how do you come up with the character and scene? Oh, let's see. Um, okay. Um, this one, so um, it was actually based on this ramen shop that I used to go to a lot in Tokyo where they had um, like Oni themed um, decor and accessories everywhere on the wall. And I was talking to Al, my, uh, my SO about like, oh, it'd be really cool to do like um, an Oni character, like based on all this stuff. He was like a little chef, mm -hmm. like a ramen chef. And it was, I was kind of just like, I had the idea in my mind, but I was just waiting for a chance to really get an excuse to, to do it. And then the contest came up and I already had the idea. So it was very much like, oh, I'll just kind of adapt this to the brief, mm -hmm. which I think is how a lot of people work when they do contests. You kind of already have something in mind and you just have to adapt it to a brief. Um, so I did some I did some sketches that you can see on the on the thread, yeah. on the um, on the work thread. Um, but I, I kind of prefer to concept um, only for maybe a day tops and then start going into 3D immediately and then um, drawing on top of the 3D model and things like that. Yeah. Um, or just like, even just like masking on top of the body to like test out different patterns for the costume. Um, and then for other ideas, I look at a lot of like anime figures to um, to kind of get the idea, just to, to get like the scope of how many props and how many characters I wanted in this piece. Um, 
and I, for other references, um, the the game Muramasa was really big for this one. Um, I really like that game. It's kind of set in like mythological Japan with like a lot of traditional folklore and demons and things like that. Um, mm. But with also kind of more of a, I wanted more of like a lighthearted feel like that game. So that was kind of the main reference point. That's great. So when you go about doing this, you said you spend one day concepting, right? Yeah, in, in 2D, I'd say. In 2D. Okay, so this is just sketching. Do you do it in a sketchbook? Yeah. Do you do it in Photoshop? Um, Photoshop, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, do you print anything out or just keep it all digital? I would keep it all digital. Okay, great. The speed, uh, yeah. And then when you do it, is there a particular... I, I didn't see the sketches, so I'm not seeing them right now, but is it... Line, line drawing, do you do silhouettes? What are some of the tools that you use to concept? Um, I would take, so I would actually go to 3D even before that and, and just do a base body where yeah. I was kind of 50% happy with the proportions. Right, so you and jump then into the doing stuff like, and uh, then... Yeah, I jumped into ZBrush first actually, first, get the okay. base body. Got it. And then I'd start doing stuff in Photoshop where I'm like, mm -hmm changing the size of the head, changing the length of the arms, using right. liquify and using the transform tools to like yep. um, experiment with the with the body shape. Yep. Um, and then for like the costume design, I would just um, draw on top of that in kind of big uh, silhouette type forms at first. Yeah. And, and then mm, sometimes I, I get really attached to an idea of like, I really wanted, um, I really wanted those like poofy sleeves and so I kind of knew oh, I definitely want poofy sleeves I'm going to do those and then work around it yeah so um and this is I guess why I'm not a concept artist is because um I do get very attached to having that I really want this element yeah. and I'll kind of like <laughs> base my design around wanting to have this element just to make it work. <laughs> so you don't want somebody stepping in and saying, well, we don't really like the poofy and we want this. Yeah. Yeah. And I'd be like, no, I, th that's the one thing I wanted to do with the costume. <laughs> and I'll just kind of brute force it. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Uh, do you have a particular brush inside of Photoshop that you like to use or, or any tools in Photoshop that are really important for you at this stage? A uh, lasso. I just like to um, use the is it rectangular lasso yeah um and then just use uh, kind of fill the lasso shape with gradient totally yeah that's because it because it looks a bit more um just elegant than mm -hmm. just filling with flat color yep. and then i just work in values so like i don't think about color yeah yeah that's great dylan cole does the same thing it was amazing in his course to see him in like 15 minutes pull together and just an awesome concept for a landscape so oh yeah i love the look of like the really hot sharp edges yes that's great yeah that's it and all right so in zbrush do you have any particular tools any uh things that you use do you use like z spheres dynamesh do you just like take a sphere and start to pull things together or do you have a base mesh i would take a, a base mesh of a previous character yeah. or i would even use one that's a realistic yeah. woman and and then it's quite curious to see how far it goes from that. Right. Um, uh, so, but what I like to do is just smooth out the base mesh a bit. So like, so I don't like it being high res either. I prefer, I prefer them when they're more on the low side okay. because I feel like with the, with the ones with, which have denser topology, the forms are more locked in. Mm, yeah. I get that. So I, pr I prefer lower, yep. lower res. Totally. Um, so my own one is kind of just like a, a very stripped back um, version of, of of like a realistic human female, but with but it, it wouldn't have enough topology to to hold up as a as a game mesh. Yeah. But for sculpting, I like to have the flexibility of having that super low res mesh not like really low res but um i know if you look at um uh like john troy nichols base mesh the one i use is actually really similar to that okay. in terms of tri count um it's it's definitely on the lower side just yeah. because the flexibility is awesome that's great and is it um 
is there a particular brush? Like, do you just go in with clay buildup or do you use the inflate brush, standard brush? Some people swear by. I actually just kind of tend to use masking and transform Okay. at first. Yeah. Um, I don't want, I don't like to subdivide yeah. yet. I, um, so I just keep like the first two subdivisions. Um, I don't really think, consider anatomy at this stage either yeah. in terms of muscle structure. I'm kind of just looking at overall proportional relationships. So like yeah, head size is really huge, um, hand size, leg length, things like that. Um, so, and then when I want to subdivide, yeah, I really like using inflate, yeah. um, especially for doing stuff like this, especially on female characters when they're really smooth. Right. Inflate, smooth and move is pretty much the only brushes I'd use. Right. For the, for the skin. Um, if you want a bit of a definition, yeah, clay buildup is really nice too. Okay, good. So inflate seems to be one of the brushes you definitely go for right off the bat. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> Do you ever use magnify or is it just inflate, inflate? Mm, I've never used magnify. Yeah. I'll give it a go. Okay, cool. It's another, it's basically, it's the same thing, but he switched the, he just altered the, um, the uh, algorithm, sorry, I lost my brain there for a second. The algorithm. So okay. uh, mag inflate tends to work by on the surface of something. So uh, it'll inflate vertices along the surface. Magnify tends to bury the center of the brush like inside of so that it'll magnify oh. outwards. Uh, I see. Yeah, they all have quite subtle differences. But, but you can kind of, it's hard to describe it. It's more of like a feeling yeah, sometimes. Yeah, that they do. All right, so uh, one day concept. So you come in, you get something kind of roughed in. Are you dividing this model as part of the concept phase? Or do you? Um, no. Yeah, I would divide it, but I wouldn't really worry about sculpting yeah. that much. It would kind of just be like a turbo smooth base mesh, essentially. So okay, great. Not really much structure. Yeah, I understand that. Are you thinking props at this point and parts? And are you thinking of the poofy sleeves and all of that stuff as well? Um, I would do that in the 2D and then yeah. see how it all looks together. Okay, that's um, awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So right here, you're just looking at like, what's the base uh, body type of this character? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, and essentially naked, right? Just no mm -hmm. clothes, just essentially yeah, just the no body type. Yet. And then yeah, you go into 2D. Yeah, just a good body shape. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when you're in, uh, and thank you so much for being patient with these with these answers. <laughs> so let me know if it gets a little detailed. Oh, yeah. I'll, I want to go through and try and answer all of them. <laughs> yeah, but it's so fascinating to see how people's different approaches. So um, once you've got a something painted and uh, and you're ready to go, like what's your next step once you're ready to get into the production of it? Um, then, yeah, after I'm fairly happy with the concepts, I'll start... Um, for things like cloth, um, I'll just mask out the shape and then use, um, ex just extrude it and split. Yeah. It's extrude. S uh, what, what do they call it in ZBrush? Extrude or? Um, you know where you extrude oh, from extract. a mask? Oh, extract, sorry, make extract. A, extract, sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah extract. Um, and then I'll Z remesh the extraction and clean it up. Yeah. Um, and then I do that for every single a cloth piece, which yeah. I, I try and think of as like, this is one asset. Yeah. So they all, you know, should have a similar amount of attention and they're all like, they're all assets basically. Um, uh, so yeah, I get everything locked out. That probably about be about a day or two's work. Yeah. Um, and then for things like spikes, yeah. I like to model those hard, just kind of hard surface with like, um, just in 3ds Max on Maya, I'd model those. Right. Because um, I, I I like having the option just to um, box model something that has to be a precise shape. Mm -hmm. um, and then when all those are in there, the next step is kind of um, becoming happy with the 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 spatial relationships with each other. So mm -hmm. how big do I want to make the shoes? Like how how wide do I want her waist to be, mm -hmm. things like that. Um, and then when I feel like fairly confident on it, then I start kind of going in and um, and really actually putting a lot of attention into the form of these individual objects. Right. So, you know, spending just a day on the shoes, for instance, just like I want to make sure, you can see it here, that there's some like wood grain 
and the, the design of the the base was just like not something I based on a real life object. So I was just kind of experimenting with several shoe designs. Um, because I knew I wanted this cut out shape. Yeah. Um, and then for cloth, I don't, I don't really add wrinkles, um, except on the sleeves. So there's a few wrinkles, but hand sculpt, or I, do you go to marvelous or um, hand sculpted for something like this because the cloth is very stylized yeah. and um, I try to only put wrinkles where. It, it would really benefit. Um, otherwise, I think wrinkles would make it too noisy. So mm -hmm. um, I personally don't don't add them to things like this. Yeah. Um, because I think the style doesn't really. I, I don't think it would benefit from having that much. But I like I still like to have a little bit. Like I still because I can't really do a character and have no wrinkles on it. You know. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I understand. But I think the most important thing for cloth is to have this lining on everything, which makes it feel like more like a cloth piece. What lining? Where it's got, uh, um, have this kind of folded edge. Ah, okay. Yeah. So that's a nice little trick to just make sure that it's like, it's got some stitched seam. Yeah. Uh, that it feels like an actual cloth piece yeah. is to have, and it has thickness to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how important is anatomy to to your process because anatomy is like this is one of the de facto um like walls that we as artists face and it's like never ending right i mean i've been studying anatomy for oh god 20 plus years and yeah it's just never ending yeah um never ending <laughs> yeah it's, i just think that I, what i'm currently doing is is never going to be perfect anatomically mm -hmm. but i think about the areas that are going to be on show yeah and then try and have some a few anatomical details like i want to put this hip bone in here yeah. because i want the thigh to be a, like an area with a lot of emphasis yeah and just having some some of the pectoral here as well yep. um so i just try and add the key landmarks of anatomy yeah but especially on like stylized females um i honestly think it looks more appealing if if the the like and anatomical markers are mostly smoothed out except a few key areas. Okay. Um, but I think anatomy influences how how the character feels and how it sits. Yeah. And I always think that the T pose has to be strong and and feel good. Otherwise, I I wouldn't feel confident progressing on on a T pose model that doesn't feel good. Got it. And are you thinking about environment at the same time that you're doing this, or do you do a character and then at the end throw an environment in? Or and you've got a whole um, other character. Have like a, yeah, um, I think about it, it kind of conceptually, and but I don't really worry about like the, too many of the details about the environment. Mm -hmm. But I just know that um, okay, by the end I'm probably not going to have time to do anything too crazy, so I'll just do like quite a simple rock sculpture or something like that yeah that's great and i want actually i want to go back to anatomy for just one second um just to get a sense of things like we know anatomy is important we also know anatomy is not necessarily essential for uh like a game artist job like you don't have to be a yeah. master of it because there's so many yeah there's so many aspects right but I agree. Um, so like how important do you think or how far or what advice let's just say it this way what advice can you offer um people that are looking to be a character artist they're looking at your work they're looking at your job and you where you are like how much time should they be devoting towards you know mastering anatomy verse um starting to really focus on concept like this and developing characters all the way i, I think it is important to have a male and female human realistic uh, sculpts mm -hmm. I, I think the benefits of that are huge yeah and um i think also to go beyond just an ecoche like a flayed man type yep. city i think it's actually really good to um to to be able to sculpt actual skin and fat on top of the muscle uh -huh. and have that look look natural yeah um because i just see 
a lot of surf and I also did this and still do it sometimes where um where like essentially there's there's no fat and skin on top and you're just looking at a flayed sculpture which mm -hmm. is is not what you're ever gonna what you know if that's never going to be in a product right um so I think getting that all to feel natural is really important um and not just like placing every single muscle but I think the the proportions between how long the limbs are and mm -hmm. um the sizes of various things is much more important than knowing the name of every single muscle like I'd say most characterists I've worked with don't can't like name every every muscle in the arm or anything sure. like um I don't think that's as important as being able to um sculpt a proportionally accurate human right because a lot of the time when when the skin and fat is on top you you don't see the underlying structure that much anyway right um but i think everyone should definitely do um like a scott eaton type study yeah. and also, also i think doing one t-pose and one um in a pose in a dynamic pose as well yeah, yeah. is really good Great. Okay. So for example, if I was to uh, say that another way, it's like for in the deltoid or in the shoulder, not necessarily yeah. understanding that there's the anterior, there's the posterior, yes. and there's, you know, the, uh, the out, all three parts of that, but just knowing mm -hmm. that there's a particular shape to it that you need to follow and yeah, holding to a that sh shape. shape and, and how that, how that sits with the rest of the torso Yeah. and having something that just feels natural, right. I think is but is far more important than having like a medically 100% accurate model that's proportioned wrong. Right. So if you were to say there's one mistake or one thing that people do in terms of the anatomy of their character that really signals to you that they're at a beginning stage, what would that be? I think it's when the, the characters are too, when they're aiming to do a realistic human yep. and they're, they're like 10 heads tall. Okay. Um, having super tall humans. Yeah. Um, I think that's why studying, I study 3D scans loads. Mm -hmm. And when I was working on uh, the racing games, that was using photorealistic humans. So yeah. I spent a lot of time studying scans and studying what actual humans look like because like anime really warps your mind <laughs> and and like playing stylized games and looking at a lot of stylized art basically like sets the standard in your brain of what a human body looks like, which yeah. is, actually really out of whack yeah like, humans are just like squat little potato creatures <laughs> really. nice fair enough <laughs> <laughs> all right so i don't want to take up your entire afternoon although i'm sure we would love to do that um do you mind now let, let's just take a look and open this up a little bit to people who have questions i'm just getting all my yeah. screens in order and then the the thing that'd be really great is just to get a sense of of the of how you do these um, of how you set up your rendering, you know. So you do this inside oh, yeah, of Marmoset sure. in uh, in Marmoset three, and then what are some of the things and the ways the processes that you know really give you this kind of distinct quality? Um, is there anything that you do right off the bat to kind of set the tone? Is do you focus on the light color? Yeah, it's like the the sky box is really important. Okay. Um, so box. I like to choose for stylized stuff. I like to choose the, the sky boxes, which are really colorful, mm -hmm. almost like um, unnaturally colorful. And sometimes you can even go into the HDRIs and saturate them a bit more, okay. which can be quite interesting. And um, I don't really alter things like the brightness, but I, I think saturation is really key. Okay. Um, let me go back to the main camera. Yeah, so this is the one I actually use for the beauty shop, which has camera effects. Okay. Um, yeah, the first thing I do would be to, yeah, choose the sky and then I would pick, um, pick the key light. Oh, I have to turn this one on. <laughs> so this is how she looks with just the sky box. Okay, so this is and, sky, um, just the HDRI. Yeah. Yeah, just HDRI, no, um, no other key lights. And then I actually see like sometimes student work will um, 
put something in Marmoset and not actually add lights. Yeah. And they'll just have the skybox. And um, with that, you like, uh, it's, it's essentially never going to look like that. And in an environment, there's always going to be at least a sun. So you want to kind of put in that sun first. OK. Um, and this is a one. particular kind of skylight. OK, got it. Oh, this one is um, a directional. OK. But uh, I know that spot is also fine. And spot, I think, actually is preferable. Um, the, the lighting tutorial that's really good is uh, Magdalena's one. Oh, yeah. She's amazing. Uh, I really, really love that. And I, I would just actually follow um, her lighting setup because she's a master of lighting Yeah. and rendering. Um, I actually only started rendering doing real time stuff, um, but she can do all, um, you know, like offline rendering as well, which is really cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah so I have this one. And then this one is super subtle, but it's just a fill. Um, because I didn't like how sh how harsh the shadow was on the leg here, okay. so <laughs> this is really particular. But I just add this fill just to kind of lighten up a few dark spots. Did you position uh, this uh, in a specific yeah, place? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I didn't talk about the widths widths or anything. But let me go to free cam again. So HDRI, oh, then one directional light, which is always a sunlight skylight of sorts, mm -hmm. and then. Yeah, uh, so is there anything special you do on that other than just orientation? Yeah, usually I change the the width and the length a little bit. Okay. Um, so if you do this, you actually affect the sharpness of your shadows. Mm, okay. So if I increase it, can you see like you get the soft shadow blur? Totally. Yeah. See, it just uh, popped right in. Yeah, that looks really great on more realistic stuff, but I actually like the graphic style really sh a harsh shadow. Mm -hmm. I mean, over here it's a little bit alias with this camera, but. Um, oh, yeah, I see. Yeah. Yeah, just maybe like 0 0.05. Great. Okay. So just a just tiny like bit that. of width. Okay. Yeah, just the, it, adjusting the width actually really impacts your shadow quality. So mm -hmm. if you ever see the alias looking shadows, it's probably because although the width and the length are set to zero, yeah. which is, is kind of crazy because you never have a light that's, that like doesn't have an actual volume, right? So mm -hmm. you can see it more on this one. Yeah, this one is um, basically like a reflector. Yeah. Like if you'd have a studio light, light setup, um, this is purely to kind of fill in shadows. OK, got it. Um, so sometimes at conventions, you see um, people walking around with like big tinfoil reflectors. So uh -huh. this is kind of doing that is to is to stop um, harsh lighting on the face, usually from the sun. Right. You know where it's gonna it's gonna really emphasize like uh, eye hollows and things like that, which um, which you don't want. Uh, and then I'd always check to to make sure the eyes are responding properly too. Okay. So. So the cornea on this has a modeled in bump. Mm -hmm. So it actually bulges out. You can see it a little bit here. So if you don't have the bump on the cornea, then the eye reflection is not going to do what you want. So it's always something to keep in mind to have that nice little dot highlight. Nice. Uh, what else? Oh, yeah, then the rim. Uh, let's turn this back on. Yeah, um, I made it. It does have some width to it, but I made it super bright and I turned it so it's really, really sharp and graphic because that's, that's how I wanted to kind of get some of the 2D look was having this like really, really sharp rim. OK, great. So this is your rim light and this is a, mm -hmm. this is basically parented to the camera. Yeah instead of the skybox so i can rotate the skybox and not have the rim light rotate and you know because when you look at it from this angle it's totally blown out yeah because you're just seeing that super bright light there yep got it and then that way it's always a rim light because it's offset from the camera <laughs> yeah that's right okay and so in this one this is a spotlight and you're definitely giving it width length um Anything else that's really important? I mean, I know spot angle is 
is there. What about spot sharpness? Is or vignette any of that significant? Mm, I think that's let's see. Angle. Sometimes I forget what they do, and I have to actually go in and adjust them. Yeah, it's like um, anatomy. I mean, everything's got a different name. You can f easily forget. <laughs> yeah. you know. I think these are actually preset uh -huh. for spotlight. Okay. Like moving distance. Oh, no, is this one? So, but oh, no, it's because I've locked it. Wait, no, I'm being, I'm being an idiot. There we go. Now I can actually mess with it. Okay. Uh, so that okay, that's the, just the direction. So how much of the character you want. We want it to affect from that angle, uh -huh. sharpness. It's kind of attenuation almost. And then vignette is the, the fall off. But I've set mine to be so bright and graphic that these won't really make much of an effect on this okay, cool. setting. And then distance. You can choose how much of, mm. how far you want the light to go. Yeah. Uh, so then after that, I would take a look in render settings and I would check to make sure, let me, let me turn off everything here so you can see. So if I turn the light this way, now you can see AO. Um, so AO only appears when it's not being illuminated by the direct lights. Okay. Um, I'll set it a little bit harsher so you can see. Okay, yeah, it's barely, there we go. Yeah, it's, it's really, really subtle. Yeah, there's a bit of a um, lag between um, uh, when you adjust it and when it comes to the screen, so. Oh, yeah, be a little bit of lag going on. Um, okay, so AO is uh, only in the shadows. Yeah. That's a nice feature. And, and definitely tick on the front face shadows. Mm -hmm. um, high res, even though putting on all these things is going to slow down you're seeing, but mm -hmm. for now I'm just on one-to-one -one resolution, but when I uh, do renders or like, um, if I'm showing someone in real life and not on a, more of a laggy stream, I, I like to turn it to double resolution, ah, okay. which is really slow, but um, you can only do things like um, hair dithering with, with double resolution, otherwise it just gets very, very dotty. Okay. And local, ref Reflections also works much better with um, double resolution. Okay. But it's a really nice feature and it kind of just adds this nice bounce. Uh, and then if I turn on GI, I'll just want to go to the, the main. Now we've run into some problems with GI, GI where it tends to create, I don't know, like a real strong ambient occlusion. Yeah. Yeah. It's actually quite difficult to balance it. Um, so when I'm turning it on and off here, I just like what it does to kind of illuminate the dark areas mm -hmm. because on the stylized pieces, I try and not have any black shadows. Got it. I kind of want all my shadows to have color. Yeah. Um, what did you say was the, was the, the thing you encountered with GI? Well, it just gets this ambient occlusion, like it starts to shadow. Um, Oh yeah, the brightness actually. Okay. Um, so I guess G GI is kind of going to be most effective when you have a whole environment that envelopes the character, okay. because otherwise the entire background, when I turned on voxels, is just black. Um, so there is, and a lot of that black is going to um, is going to be like showing up in the GI. Mm. Okay. So I'd like to turn up the brightness. Yeah. Because if when I turn it down. Got it. So the HDRI, sorry, the HDRI is actually pretty important for that then. Yeah. So you, you can see it with less brightness here. It's, it's really black. Mm -hmm. And then when I turn it up more, it's going to brighten up your scene. It can go obviously excessive, but. Mm -hmm. It's nice though. Okay. So yeah. lighting. Um, and you've got your three lights. You've got a uh, sunlight, you've got a fill light, and you've got a rim light. Yeah. And then uh, you've got all the all the high quality settings set in the light in the render settings, and including GI. Uh, and then how about this? What's next? I won't guide this. I just ask. So what do you do next? Oh sure. Um, so at that point, I probably start refining materials more. Okay. So I'm going to have to move this. Yeah, I was going to ask if there's a material that you've just used 
so many times that now it's just part of your vocabulary? Um, yeah, okay. um, that'll be the subsurface. Um, so for this, I pretty much use um, subsurface diffusion for everything except metals. Okay. Because um, I think having the subsurface is essential to getting stylized materials. Okay. Um, so what did I do for her? So I think the body was the only object I actually unwrapped because I wanted to have the control. Mm -hmm. So she has, she's got, she's got a gloss map, which when I, um, I needed to make this because I wanted to have some shine on the, on her body, but not on her face. So when you're doing kind of anime like faces, it's important to have the, the actual face quite matte and you only want a little highlight on the nose and lips. So you don't just want to leave that to a slider. You want to actually have some customization, but often the rest of the skin is quite shiny. So it's nice to have like a little highlight going on on the thigh. Mm -hmm. But for instance, you wouldn't want that on the face because it's just going to look greasy. Oh, interesting. Okay, I get that. So I really like to have control over that. Uh -huh. uh, and then, yeah, that's that's a albedo texture. Yeah, do you do this inside of um, Substance or Photoshop or Zebra? Oh, this was um, polypaint, and then I baked the polypaint to UV. Okay, got it. Yeah, so really, really simple, um, but it's got a little bit of hue variation a little bit of orange here and there. Mm -hmm. And of course you want, you really want to emphasize the eyes. Yeah. Um, and then for scatter, scatter settings, um, these will only work correctly if the model scale is reasonable. So when you turn on the, the character scale, there's an option in here to show it show scale reference. Okay, there it is. So in this scene, that's, she's like around seven feet tall, uh -huh. which is fine because that's, that's human scale. But sometimes when you import a character, they're going to be like a thousand feet tall or something. So um, if, if your character is not within a reasonable scale, then the scatter depth and the skin shading and all the subsurface is not going to work correctly. So that's really important. Oh, that's great. That's great information. Yeah. Um, to get a lot of shaders to work, um, scale of the object is really crucial. Okay. Um, All right. And then, then um, I'd like to do. Yeah. And, and also, I'd love to hear about the hair, uh, too. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because you have yeah. Because it looks like it's got that, um, it's got that, fr not that Fresnel. What do they call it? It's Anisotropic. That, there you go. Yeah. I'll find the material for the hair. Oh, let's see. Hair front. Is it this one? Just going to make sure I'm on the right one here. Yeah. Uh, okay, here we go. So, um, the color is just controlled by polypaint. So this, this, this hasn't been baked to a texture. It's, it's just raw poly paint that's actually saved to the vertex. So I use vertex color to get that just to show up. Um, I could have just set it to a local color, except I actually painted in um, this lighter color on the edge of the bangs um, because you can see in a lot of, um, a lot of Eastern art, they often paint the tips of the bangs a bit lighter to mm. kind of um, get the idea across that, um, that the hair is, is like thinner at that point and, and is kind of like feathering out. So they often do the thing where they'll color the, just the tips of the bangs, like, uh, they'll take the local color from, from the skin. Mm -hmm. So I really wanted to try and do that. Uh, let's see. Yeah, this has all got a scatter. And it's really subtle. I mean, on the stream might not even pick it up, but it just kind of smooths everything out a bit. Yeah, I caught uh, it. It is subtle, but we caught it that. 
okay, so here's the fuzz. You can see it looks a little blend without fuzz. So when I put it back on, it gives like a nice Fresnel to the edges of the hair. Yep. But um, this default setting is white. Um, you definitely don't want it to be white though. You should um, customize the color and have some um, have some saturation in there, which matches the local color of the hair. Yeah. Okay, so anisotropic. Yeah, same with these specular values here. Um, you definitely don't want these to be white. So if I change that to white, you can see how oh, yeah. that looks it's, it's uglier in comparison. Yeah. So you want to have the saturation in there. Mm -hmm. um, so if I turn down the intensity, there it's gone. And then you don't want it too high because it can start looking a bit metallic. And the Fresnel is just the edges. But you also don't want that as bright white because it can look quite immersion breaking. Okay. Uh, so for a reflection there, you just want to turn this from a Blin Fong to an isotropic. Um, can we see what it looks like Blin Fong? Oh yeah, sure. Give a second update. There we go. So it kind of just looks like the jelly bean mat cap uh -huh. in ZBrush. Uh -huh. and you don't have those nice uh, streaks. So when I turn this back, yeah, now you see the direction has changed. So yep. when you're setting up your hair, you want to play with this slider until the direction matches the orientation of the object. Um, you can actually put a direction map in there except um, for something like this, because I'm controlling the, the hair front and the hair back separately, yeah. um, this is such a, a small area that I didn't need to do a map because I've just broken it up into two pieces. Okay. Um, and then secondary reflection is literally just to kind of really pop that. So I had this one as white. But I could, I could try and make this a nicer color. But sometimes you can kind of get away with having a paler, a less saturated secondary reflection, mm -hmm. as long as your primary reflection is, is color. So yeah, the most important thing is just changing this to an isotropic and then um, adjusting the direction slider to match your, your actual object. Great. Okay, and then um, last thing before I think we open it up to people, the uh, material for the objects, this like this piece on the shoulder. Oh, yeah. Um, Let's find this. Yeah. So how I've done this is... So I've set up these materials as kind of swatches. Mm -hmm. So they're all using vertex color, but they just have different specular values. Um, let me find the one for... There's a lot of sharing going on, so it could, it could be wood actually. Sharing? See wood. Yeah, so um, I'll show you in a sec. Oh, this one's wood. Uh, where is it? Just making sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, so everything that I wanted to be kind of um, subsurface, but quite matte, with a little bit of spec, uses this wood shader, and I ended up applying it to the pig as well because I liked how it looked. Um, and the ground also uses this one. Is this a default uh, or something you made yourself? I made this one myself, so it's just subsurface. Okay. Aerial. Um, it's got scatter depth, and then if I turn that off, it's re it's really hard to see. But yeah, oh, it. you can see it now. Okay, kind of just go. like yep. Yeah, it has a more skin-like translucent quality. So we, if as you in, can you take it to zero or really low? And yeah, it's just pause. Yeah, you can see how harsh the shadows are there. There we go. Yes. So if I want the soft shadows, I have to increase scatter depth. All right. And this is definitely one of the keys, I think, to the illustrative quality yeah. that just kind of yeah. 
makes the, it makes the hard edges disappear that exist in 3D. Yeah, definitely. Uh, this is really essential. That's great. Um, let me try and find the material I use for this. That cupboard. Oh, maybe it could be cloth mats. Okay, here we go. Yeah, so the cloth mats material uh -huh. is applied to pretty much everything. I wanted to have less spec. So if I turn on the vertex color, it's used across loads of different things. But I wanted to have, um, so I've got cloth shiny as well which goes on the more like satin cloth pieces. Mm -hmm. And then this matte one I applied to the shoulder piece as well, because I wanted that to just be like completely matte so it didn't detract too much attention yeah. from the face area. But on these ones, um, I'm using microfiber. So ah, instead of some surface, I okay. use microfiber. Okay. So it's a little bit cheaper to run. Um, it, it doesn't have the subsurface, which is fine for what I'm doing, but having fuzz is really important for cloth. Okay. Let's see it um, off again real quick. It'll take a second to update. All right, that's off. Mm -hmm. And now on as you put it back on. Oh, yeah. Serves that same purpose uh, in a sense that it takes light that hits it and it kind of just spreads it out across the... The surface, That's right. right? Yeah. Okay, so like subsurface or like wax in ZBrush. Mm hmm. Oops. All and right. then I have a little bit of specular intensity as well because um, I think it, it just feel, it felt a bit too matte without anything at all. I'll try and find an angle where you can see that. Yeah, so I've just got a little bit of specular here. Okay. I didn't like the look of it being completely flat. So yeah. even the matte cloth still has some specular to it. All right. Well, that is amazing. So we've gone through, and in summary, the, some, the essential elements are, number one, get your light set up, parent your mm -hmm. rim light to your camera, get your, uh, your sunlight, your directional light, get your fill light. Mm -hmm. uh, and then... Uh, one of the key components there is going to be making sure you get the width correct. Yeah. So that you yeah. really get a for nice the, edge. Yeah, for your nice soft shadows. Yeah. But width gearing, and length also. Okay. But keeping it on the low side so you keep it graphical. Yeah. Okay. Great. And then you go in and you're setting up your lighting settings. Uh, and then we come into materials. And one of the key things that I understood about the materials is just making sure that you're using subsurface scattering or microfiber. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then working with that um, that scatter distance. Yeah, that's right. And making sure your scale scene scale is um, is correct in the context of of Marmoset. Okay, this is that's great. Okay, so um, for everybody who's here in this uh, live, I want you guys to do me a favor. I want you to all go to Artist Awake and go to the live version of this video and. Um, and I want you to, while we're answering questions, I want you to post the one thing that you, excuse me, that you really pulled out of this, um, of this series of demonstrations. What's the one thing you really learned that kind of made a difference? So make sure you head over. It's at Artist Awake. You go to the studio, and we're streaming live there right now, and I'm looking at the chat um, as I speak. So I'm looking there, and as you type in, I will see it. Um, enter in one thing that you learned from this so that I can make sure that uh, Blair sees that and she gets that feedback from you guys uh, and gets a real sense of what she's communicated. She's going to be really, you know, it's important for the speaker, for people who are doing this because, you know, we were just talking into basically a computer screen. So give us that feedback. And then I'm going to go through your questions and uh, we're going to start answering those. Yeah, questions. All right. Um, Axel, would you use this amount of shaders when presenting a game res piece? So um, before you answer that, there's a big question inside of the um, boot camps that we do that, uh, you know, there's what you do in game and then there's what you do to get the job so that you can do that in mm. games. Yeah. And I tend to see those as, as different because 
you know, in game, you, you, you know, you're following a pipeline, and they just want to know that you can do that stuff. They don't want to know that you can do everything about it. At least that's my experience. Um, most of the time, I think people want to know that you can be a creative, valuable member of the team. Yeah. Um, so uh, with that in mind, would you use the same amount of shaders when presenting a game res piece? And then what, you know, what could you say might be different between what you do here for yourself and what you do in the job? So I think um, that depends on the, um, the current state of your project. Uh -huh. So for example, if you're in pre-production, um, doing tests like these is essentially look development work. So um, what you're showing here is going to be really valuable in terms of um, visually communicating to the tech artists what shaders you need in your actual engine that you're using to replicate this look. So I really use Marmoset a lot um, on the job to mm -hmm. kind of illustrate a best case scenario of this, this is the look dev I've done. What do we need to implement in order to replicate this the best we can in game? Um, but if, if you're further along the pipeline and you're actually in full production, then um, I would not go to this length because essentially then what you're doing is kind of um, taking away time you could be devoting to making this look the best it can in the proper context of the engine you're using. And doing work like this when it's in full production, um, I think it can come across as a little more like selfish that you're kind of just um, doing this work for your own portfolio and uh -huh. you're not as focused on making the product look its best. So I think it totally depends on the stage of the project. So it can either be very useful or it can be a, more of a distraction later on when, when all your in-game shaders, what you're using and your, when your actual in-game pipeline is already 100% locked down. Got it. Great. All right, guys, I'm seeing some questions there, but not, or some comments, but not enough. So Ted, Shyam, Sari, Ocean, Narciss, uh, Matthew, Lyle, we got yours. Lyle learned that people are short, let's read the exact uh, <laughs> quote, are squat potato creatures. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Corey, need to see what you have picked up out of this. Um, Isaac just posted his, and uh, yeah, just waiting on Alex. Alyssa, and I think Axel, did you post your comment? Okay, great. All right, so um, Eric's, Eric's saying uh, he's learned uh, to use the microfiber shader for stylized characters. That's great. Um, Adam is saying concepting and building the scene along with the lighting to pull it all together. So probably process was really important for um, Adam there. Uh, Brian Link is saying the thought process of going about setting up and lighting stylized characters. Great. Uh, Corinne learned how she uses area lights as reflectors or fills uh, and found that to be a nice shortcut. Great. Um, and these are, uh, Blair, these are being posted on Artist Awake, so you're not necessarily seeing those in the uh, GoToMeeting interface. You're in right uh, now. Awesome. Cool. Um, Isaac, the importance uh, of anastropic and subsurface and then using hard or soft shadows mm -hmm. to set the uh, stylization. Uh, Jane, concepting, uh, utilizing 2D and 3D skills to pull the idea together. And then uh, the last comment I have here is, Corey, I learned that changing the color of the specular highlight in hair can be really important. Great. Oh, and then uh, Narciss was uh, learning about the shadow quality. That's something I've really picked up on too, so that was really cool to see. And then Alyssa is saying, thank you for the in-depth explanation on how to set up lighting in Marmoset. Okay, cool. Uh, Ted learned about anastropic. Okay. And then I'm just reading these as they come in, guys, because uh, this is really great information. And also, when you hear how other people, what other people learned, it, it gives you a, a different takeaway than what you might have had yourself. So, Matthew, my big takeaway from listening to Blair was the mindset she adapts when approaching her art, adopts, sorry, uh, focusing on proper proportions over raw anatomical definition, being smart about your materials and lighting as it pertains to your target art, and of course loved her thoughts on shadows and specular lighting. Thanks, Matthew. Uh, okay, 
and then uh, Axel. Uh, learn how shadow quality and shaders make the stylized vibe to rendering. And uh, Axel, I think we're going to take a look at Axel's here in just a second. Axel, and I want to take a look at Lyle's. Um, Oceane, a lot of tips on rendering and lighting that I didn't know, like how to get soft shadows that fit this kind of cute character. Corey, uh, the width of the light was really cool. Yeah, that was actually cool for me to, to learn too. I didn't know about that in, in uh, Marmoset. Yeah, it's really huge actually. I didn't know about it until a few years ago. <laughs> yeah. uh, and then uh, Sari, my takeaway is lighting setups and her way of creating. Okay. Okay, all right, so let me go through and see if there's any other questions. And then um, if you're game, Blair, I want to just uh, introduce two people's work to you and just get your feedback. Oh, yeah, that'd be awesome. Uh, and you're on, you're on Artist Awake, but you don't have access to the – yeah, maybe you should have access to the groups. Uh, um, let me see. Yeah, do me a favor. Up at the um, top, search for Lyle, L-Y-L-E. You just go to his page, and if we scroll down. Oh, cool. Yeah, that's the latest one that he's working on. So, Lyle, you're on um, right now. Give me a, uh, a note in chat if there's something specific you wanted Blair to see. But otherwise, if you keep scrolling down, there was the – oh, yeah, that's a fine way to do that. Oh, here we go. Oh, cool. Oh, oh, he's done. No, I think he's – this is all – this is reference we're pulling in. Oh, okay, awesome. Yeah. So uh, let's go. Let's go into this timeline and just scroll all the way down. Yeah, timeline. Okay. I was really confused for a sec. I was like, "Wait, we yeah. worked together?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, these are uh, uh, when they're getting the reference together. Mm. Oh, is, is it this character? Nope. Oh, can I go further? It should be. I think I'm at the bottom. Okay. All right. So do me a favor. If you don't mind just Googling his name, um, it looks yeah. like uh, Artist of Wake just it. doesn't give you – and we'll go to his art station. Yeah. Oh, here we go. Yes. Yeah, we, um, yeah, we spoke the other day on Twitch yep. – on, sorry, on Discord. Great. Yeah, this is awesome. I really, really like this. Cool. So the key thing that we, we really focus on in the boot camp is this one idea that in when people are looking at the work, now there's, of course, you're looking at the work, you look at it with your artist eye, and then there's HR that looks at it before, and, and, uh, and they look at it with their different eye, their checklist. And so one of the things that we really try to focus on is this idea of like, what are the triggers that tell somebody, either yourself or HR or whoever's reviewing the work, that Lyle has um, uh, what it takes to, to do the job and what are the triggers that say that um, you know he may or may not have it. So if you're looking at this, like what is the thing, uh, one, or one thing that shows you here that Lyle can do this job? Um, well, to me, he's, per he's, he's almost perfectly um, – replicated the style of the product mm -hmm. um he's clearly got a certain amount of mastery over sculpting forms mm -hmm. and he's definitely captured the kind of chunky silhouettes and he's not overly detailed things mm -hmm. and he's kind of taken time to put um details and creases in the right area and he he's like managed to interpret how how we we've done materials on this project so we yeah. don't really use like noisy textures everything's quite uniform there's no um there's not much noise to the textures yeah um everything's quite clean so yeah. he's clearly got a grasp with the style and i feel like um there's still a lot i could i would want to critique on this one but um he understands the product and this and the style very clearly Okay, and then if there was one thing that you'd say, it's like this is the trigger that's going to make somebody doubt that he can do this job. Or maybe there's more, but I'm, I'm sure it's quite limited. Mm. I think the presentation is good, but 
the pose of the character could be stronger. And yeah. I, I know that when we're doing game art jobs, we're, we're going to be presenting a lot of things in T-Pose just to hand off. But I think when you're at an earlier stage in your pro project, I'd say not just for your own portfolio, but for actual jobs, it's really crucial to present things in, a, in the best way you can in order to sell an idea to the team, in order to produce um, work for, for publishers to look at, um, in order to kind of give them confidence in the art. So um, I'd want to see like a, a better, better mastery of, of posing. Okay. And, and I can kind of go into that if you're curious. Uh, is there any quick tips that uh, that you wouldn't mind sharing with us? Yeah, so I think the balance of him is he's leaning way too much to the to the left hand side here. Mm -hmm. um, like his center of balance is off. Um, that's the re the really thing the key thing that stands out to me is just like the overall balance of the character, and I I also feel in this image it's a little, everything's a little squashed together. I'd want to see more space between these renders so they're not quite as squished onto the page. Um, what else would I say? Um, the, po it, the pose is so nearly there, it's, it would literally just take a few tweaks. Um, let me look at it on the Mama Set Viewer. Yeah, you can kind of see it here, like the leaning. So. Um, you'd want to try and get more contrapos contraposto going on, which is where you have your your hips and shoulders should be at different angles. Whereas here, his hips and shoulders are kind of both leaning off to one side. So you kind of want to have a tilt that balances the character. If you just kind of Google contraposto, you actually get some really nice examples on um, classical art piece pieces. Um, That's great. And the other thing I would, I would critique on this one would be um, some of the way he's done. You've done the skin is I'm not. I don't really think this really suits the style of having these like these cavities on mm -hmm. the muscles. Um, most of the skin we did for this is is a little softer, and we wouldn't really draw in these lines here. Um, it's it's getting a bit like Joe Mad style. Um, and a lot of our reference for this was like a more Ethan artwork where um, the skin has a softer feeling. Um, also on the face, yeah, you can really see it here, like just really ease up that cavity and paint out the cavity as well. So um, it's good to have the generated cavity map in substance, but um, also go in and customize it. Um, also what I feel is missing is just some more hand painter techniques. So we do still use a lot of, um, I guess, League of Legends style um, hand painting things in mind. So on this collar here, I would paint in AO. I would not have that that harsh value change um, kind of brings me out of it. And I would also just want to paint a little more. I see you do have AO in there, but I'd, I'd like to see it with more fall off. So a, a broader AO. Got overall and, and just kind of like avoid these really video gamey looking harsh values changes great all right thank you so much lyle any follow-up questions just shoot them out and then um if you don't mind let's take a look at axel's work um and with axel we've been working a lot on the render we were we, were, we had um some struggles to kind of get it uh looking right and so if you were to head back to artist awake oh yeah and uh, if you just go into, uh, I think that's Facebook. Oh. They look alike, but uh, oh, it would be the first. This one. Yes, there you go. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and then actually just go into the studio. So if you just type in studio, uh, then it'll be a group. And you just go right into mm -hmm. that group. And I just made the post right. It should be right at the top. So scroll down just a little bit. There you go. Right there with Axel. Um, and oh, the, this one. Yeah. So, uh, oh, cool. yeah, just look at the images there. So I, I kind of curated a few images that I thought might be relevant. Um, but the, this render is something that we've been trying to get right and make it not look blinny, 
you know, like mm-hmm. as like a blend. Yeah. Uh, so any thoughts on this? Like what can he do to, um, to really further this? I know you just went through a whole tutorial, but. Um, yeah. So the first thing I noticed on this is the shadows look really pixelated. Mm-hmm. So I'd want to check the scene scale. Okay. To, to make sure the character is falling within those human, um, that human scale. Um, cool. And then I'd go to look at your direct lights, your key lights, and make sure they do have um, width and length mm-hmm. to stop this kind of pixelation happening. Um, the I, f- I feel like it's getting a little overexposed almost. Mm-hmm. Um, the lighting on her skin, like I can see on the cheek there and on the nose, is almost going to white. So I would almost want to just like tone down that light a little bit. Um, and then there is a rim light going on here also. See the full body one. Oh yeah. Um, I think the rim light needs to be angled down. So you're getting, so you get the rim on the legs here because otherwise the value just kind of blends into the background a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, also, I would check your camera. Let me go here. So, yeah, you, yeah, check your field, field of view. Um, let me go to the free cam one. So for, for characters, I like to have a really low field of view and have it quite almost orthographic. Um, so anything within the 20 to 30 range, I think, looks good. Yeah. And then as soon as you start increasing this oh wait I'm on the wrong camera (laughs) 20 free cam okay so this one is higher and you can actually tell it's a bit more fisheye but I think the default one is something like this and can you see how like short it makes the character look oh yeah absolutely compared to when you have a more orthographic view, so put it like 18. Yep. And you zoom back out, then you're really seeing the true proportions and the, the really the character and it's just a much more flattering angle. So um, I would check this field of view and make sure it's nice and low. Um, you can kind of tell, I think it's a little high because I can see, I can see the top of her shoes and the camera looks like it's straight on almost, but I can still see the tops of her feet. So I would flatten this camera. Um, that's always going to look more flattering, I think. Um, yeah, and get and get the nice the nice rim light on the side of the leg there. Great. Um, ev- everything else I think looks nice, except um, I'm not really a fan of the background, and I think um, it'd be nice to turn on shadow catching in in tool bags. So you get some nice cast shadows. And then I would kind of just make this background a, a flatter color so you don't get these like compression stripes. Great. All right. Um, Axel, if you got any questions, just type them out and uh, we can go from there. So if we head back to your, uh, to Marmoset, we can start wrapping mm-hmm. this up. So thank you so much for, um, for answering all of that, for, for being there. No problem. That's really fun. Yeah, this has been a great. So if we were um, if we were to kind of start to segue to the end, like what is, what is it that you think game artists or people who are aspiring, aspiring to be game artists, what do you think they really need today to, to really just help them get up on the job? What, did, what, should, what are they focusing on that if they focus on it for 10 weeks would make a difference? Hmm. To get that, to get that first job. To get the first job, because you know that's all we like. Once you got the first job, like the you scaled the mountain. A yeah, l- a little bit. Um, yeah, I think this this step really the the presentation. Um, I think that should be a huge part of your schedule is making sure that you're not just kind of half assing the presentation and really putting the time in that it deserves yeah. um, and keep checking 
everything, like every stage before you've even put textures on, check to see if your lights are looking pixelated, like check to see if you're getting nice soft shadows. And be yeah, before you even load on color, that can actually make it a little tougher to see what's going on. Like just have your character's grayscale just with a normal map, make sure, um, make sure everything is baked correctly, mm -hmm. make sure um, nothing is inverted. Um, and then you can gradually start applying materials and tune them one by one. Um, and the way I've done it here is a lot easier to tune individually. But right. um, when you're doing your substance work, go back and forth between your between either UE4 or Marmoset or whatever you want to present. Um, don't leave it all to the end. I would say like um, keep checking as you as you're texturing every single piece. Keep going between your target renderer and your texturing software and mm. making sure it's looking good um, and start that process early. That's great. Um, I, I also think even getting the, um, the just the head sculpt into a game engine and looking at it in something other than ZBrush is really helpful. Um, you know, you have that thing where like the field of view in ZBrush is so different to, to the target renderer that I think it's good to like start looking at stuff on the presentation side while you're still doing the sculpts, like try not to think of everything in segments, but like try and think of like the whole holistic character presentation. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Great. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you guys for coming in live and for uh, engaging Blair and giving her feedback and Blair, thank you so much. That was just amazing. I mean, really. And I'm a huge fan of your work, so thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thanks so much for having me, Absolutely. and thanks for watching, you guys. It's um, yeah, it's really good to see all the work here. It's really, really high quality, yeah. and yeah, feel free to reach out also. Um, just like, I, yeah, I, I don't mind answering messages and like doing um, feedback and everything. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't mind at all. Awesome. All right, guys, take care, Blair. I will talk to you later. Hopefully, we'll have you down in Laguna. Have a brunch down oh, here. Oh, that'd be good. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Take care, everybody. Have a fantastic weekend. See you later. Bye.